Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. Today we sit down with another fellow podcaster and skilled trades advocate, Mr. Cal Weeb. Cal grew up in a skilled trades family with his dad and uncle driving truck and another uncle as an electrician. He knew from an early age that the path for him would be a blue collar one and never thought twice about it. Despite completing his first level apprenticeship in electrical before graduating high school, he ended up getting into parts for heavy equipment. When work got scarce, he fell back on his electrical background and landed a job with a local family owned company. This eventually led him to his current company as a construction electrician. Through his journey, he remained exceptionally passionate about his craft, which led to co hosting the Skill Trades podcast. This gave him a platform to share his knowledge, experience, and perception of working with your hands. Listen in to hear all about Cal's journey, some of the most important aspects of the skilled trades, and what he's learned both personally and professionally over many years of hard work. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel and on our website at blueisthenewwhite.com to receive all the latest updates. As always, this show is not monetized and we don't run ads. We rely strictly on the word of mouth from our listeners to further the mission. So if you enjoyed this episode, please take a minute to rate it, review it, and share it. The future generations of tradespeople depend on it. They depend on you. So thank you again and enjoy this episode of Blue is the New White with Cal Weeb. Welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. Extremely excited about the guest I have with me today. His name is Cal Weeb. He was introduced uh, through a mutual friend, and I am just incredibly curious about Cal and where he comes from and the trade that he's in and, and how he got here. But first, Cal, welcome to the Blue is the New White podcast. Awesome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on the show. I know, you know, when you reached out to me, I was I was super stoked to come on. It's I just love connecting with with fellow blue trades or blue collar uh, podcasters. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I was going to save this for later on in the episode. But Cal also has his own skilled trades podcast called coincidentally, the skilled trades podcast. So we're going to get into that a little later in the show. But first, Cal, for those of the listeners that don't know who you are, why don't you go ahead and kind of introduce yourself, give us a little background, and tell us how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. Um, I, I grew up in rural Manitoba, which is in Canada for all the U.S. people. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, growing up, all my family background was mostly farming. And I had uncles who drove truck. Uh, my dad drove truck for a lot of my childhood. And I had one uncle who was an electrician. And funny enough, I would, I would help him out from time to time, you know, cleaning out his van and doing inventory and stuff. And I swore I will never, ever become an electrician. <laughs> and just growing up, I, I thought of so many different possibilities coming through high school. I was... I was looking at becoming uh, a prison guard or driving truck, you know, kind of following in the footsteps of my dad. And then my parents were like, hey, why don't you look into getting into a trade? So it started out, I started looking at diesel mechanics, like heavy duty mechanics, uh, an auto body. And then my parents kind of said, well, what about an electrician? You know, that's a good skill to have. And and thankfully, you know, I'm glad they, they recommended that to me. And the high school I went to had a really amazing electrical program in which through completing it, I actually received my first level of apprenticeship through, through high school. So I came out of high school with my first level apprenticeship in electrical. And I still wasn't sure. And at the time during high school, uh, I started working when I was 14. So in high school, I was working at an agricultural dealership and, you know, mowing grass, cleaning tractors, washing equipment. And then I actually started apprenticing as a parts person, which is apparently a, a red seal trade in Canada. 
And I started doing that as an apprenticeship. And shortly after I graduated, then they told me that, sorry, we don't have any more work for you. And by the way, there's four days left in this week, and this is your last week. Oh, geez. <laughs> no pressure. So, no, no pressure at all. And I was like, I, I freaked out. I was like, I just came out of high school and now they're telling me I don't have a job. What am I going to do? And my first thought was, I have electrical in my back pocket. And throughout high school, I had tried to get on with different electrical companies in the area and no luck. And then I, I was just frantic. I was calling places that were hours away. Hey, you guys looking for someone? And funny enough, it was the last place I called and it was on a Thursday, sorry, no, it was on a Wednesday that I called them and they said, yes, we're looking for a guy. Can you call back tomorrow? We're just closing up shop now. And I was like, absolutely. I'll call you back tomorrow. And so Thursday afternoon, I called them and they're like, yep, can you come in for an interview on Friday? And I'm like, absolutely. You know what? What time? I'll be there. I was just so happy that I had found something and I wanted to make a good impression. And I, I drive out there and I pull up and they kind of asked me what my experience is. And I tell them, you know, I did my level one in high school. I haven't worked for an electrical company before. And they're like, yep, you can start on Tuesday. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Hey, before we go further, I got a couple of questions about your, your high school career. Um, so it sounds like you kind of had a leg up on, on, on those who didn't know much about the trades because your whole family, it sounds like was in the trades in some capacity or another, uh, which is great. Cause I think there's, there's a lot of perceptions out there that evolve because people don't have family in the trades or they don't know anyone in the trades. So they're just left to the assumptions that they see and, TV and the media, you know, that kind of stuff, which um, is, is not a great place to get information about the trades, you know. Um, so I'm curious, your, your high school, clearly they had a great electrical program, uh, which was awesome and it allowed you to get your uh, first level uh, apprenticeship uh, while still in high school. That's, that's great. But was there an emphasis on the trades in your high school or was the emphasis still on, hey, go to university and, and get this, this education? Well, it's interesting about the area that I come from is there's a huge trades presence. And there's so many tradespeople. It's a very industrial and building heavy area, but it's still always a little viewed, like it's always looked down upon as you're in a trade, you didn't do well in school, you know, you're a little bit dumb. So all you could do was work with your hands. And in high school, it was actually a group of probably about six high schools together. They had just a ton of different trades programs. They had welding, they had a plumbing program, auto body, auto mechanics, diesel mechanics, horticulture, and all these different trades programs to help youth that were looking to get a leg up. And it wasn't really pushed. I mean, they would sometimes come and do a presentation and, you know, people kind of roll their eyes. And, oh, yeah, it's just one of these presentations, right? And it was still kind of that viewpoint that we're going to college, you know, we're going to university, we want to get good grades. And the people who got into these programs, they just were kind of viewed as, oh, they just want to go goof off and get an easy credit for high school, <laughs> which was not at all the case. I mean, the first day I walked into that electrical class, the teacher said, if you're here for an easy credit, this isn't an easy credit. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love that, that he kicked it off with some truth. And I mean... I gave my all through that electrical program and I know we were, as guys, we were super competitive in there, always trying to, you know, get the best marks and do the quickest work and everything. And, and before COVID uh, in the province here, all the way across Canada, each province has a skills competition in which high school students and college students can go and compete 
for a medal, essentially. And my teacher ended up choosing me to go to the skills competition. And that in itself was just such a different experience. You know, it was, it was honestly incredibly nerve wracking because, you know, you're going up against the best of every high school in the province. And we got four hours to complete a project. And I, I ended up finishing or placing with a bronze medal. And I was super happy with that. And, you know, to say, you know, hey, I'm the third best junior electrician in the province. <laughs> that and, is cool. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm kind of glad that I didn't win gold because I think it would have gone to my head a little bit. But, <laughs> yeah. And I was just, I guess even in high school, I just had a passion for showing young people, hey, these are the trades. You know, look, consider getting into a trade. And I know my my high school electrical teacher, he would hold little workshops to show like grade seven and eight students what the trades were all about. And I would help him out on these. And like, you know, it didn't matter if it was a boy or a girl. Hey, get your hands on it. Let's do a, a simple circuit. And some of the kids were like, oh, this is so boring. You know, I don't, I'm confused. It's like, come on, guys, this is exciting. You know, this is when you're at that age, that's when you start to think about what you're going to do after high school. And I guess at, at a younger age already, I was passionate about that, about helping other kids figure out what they were going to do for their future. Wow. That's, you know, that's interesting that you say that because usually, and I've talked to a lot of people now, I think this is episode like 93 or 94. And I hear that a lot, that people have this passion in the trades for, for helping others, right? Whether it's, whether it's helping people, um, you know, kind of wrap their arms around the trades or whether it's helping people as a service uh, from being in the trades or whatever. But I think you're the first person to say that you had that passion at such a young age. So I find that, I find that really intriguing. And listening to your story, I mean, it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like, you know, you kind of, you know, when you, when you listed out uh, your high school career there, it sounds like you knew that the trades were going to be the route for you and, and never really questioned that. Is that, is that accurate? In a way, yes, because when I was working as a parts person, I had actually inquired to the company. I was looking to get to move on in the company and become a salesperson. And they shut that door on me. They said, oh, well, we would like it if you could go get a bachelor's of agricultural degree. And I said, forget that. I'm not wasting four years of my life for it <laughs> just to not even have a guarantee that I'm going to have a sales position to come back to. So, and I knew I didn't want to be a parts guy forever. So I was kind of looking for other things, but then when that door closed on me, then it was, you know, this is trades is my, is my world now. And, you know, it, it was always something that was in the back of my mind, you know, Hey, you did well in school, but you could, use your hands to do something even better, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I hear these stories all the time too of like, you know, counselors telling people, "Hey, you're too smart to go into the trades" or "Hey, you're too you're too smart to to work with your hands." And, you know, that that really contributes to this perception that we're seeing today that the trades are like, you know, a, a, a an alternative to college. I don't even like that word, alternative to college because I feel like people need to understand that the trades industries should be and can be regarded in the same way that we regard these white collar jobs, right? You know, I, I like to use the association of doctors, lawyers, and stockbrokers, you know, without, without, without a hospital, without a building, doctors can't practice, without their equipment being worked on and serviced and maintained every day they can't practice without courtrooms lawyers can't defend without without commodities stock traders can't sell right they can't trade and and where do commodities come from these these all come from you know the skilled trades and i feel like if those associations were 
were made a little bit more often that we could generate even more intrigue around these wonderful, valuable industries. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I guess with the pandemic and everyone was like, you know, thanks to the first responders and the nurses and everything. And it, it honestly kind of irked me that nothing was mentioned about the tradespeople that kind of kept everything running in the background, that they didn't get any recognition. I mean, I don't go to work expecting or expecting recognition. I mean, I'm there to do my job, but it would just kind of be nice to rec- be recognized for the work that I do, you know, once in a while, just, hey, this is what we do. We kind of lurk in the shadows, right? Yeah, I, I agree so much with that, you know, because you're you're absolutely right, you know, and, and of course, not to take anything away from, from the medical professionals and everybody who is working their asses off, you know, trying to, trying to do their jobs as well, but you're absolutely right, you know the skilled trades was right there on the front lines too, except nobody talked about it, you know? And, and I'm not talking about just in the hospitals, although they were in the hospitals just as much as the doctors and the nurses were, you know, because that the climate still needed to be maintained. The, the electrical still needed to be worked on. The cafeterias were still running, you know, and, and all that equipment still needed to be serviced. And, you know, you never hear that these people are in and out of, of those facilities every day. And then it extends beyond that as well. I mean, the restaurants that are out there and the things like that. I know a lot of the restaurants closed for a while, but there was a good period of time where, you know, at least at least in, in my area of the United States, I don't know what it was like, uh, you know, by you, but there were a lot of restaurants and areas that were still open, 25% capacity, you're still open for drive-through, just no no dine in and all of this stuff still has to be maintained. So there are tradespeople in and out of these locations, you know, while the pandemic is going on and you never hear anybody talk about, Oh, thank you to the skilled trades industries, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I know when the, all the restrictions were first hitting and, and when really it became a reality, hey, you know, the world's shutting down. Us tradespeople, like we were scared. We were like, are we going to be able to come back to work tomorrow? And all of a sudden it was made very clear, you know, you guys are essential workers. But we're not going to really recognize you. You're just going <laughs> to have to keep working in the background. Yep. You're essential, but we're not going to tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and like you said, you know, not to take anything away from the healthcare workers and the first responders, but you know, like you said, it's we work in the background keeping everything running and no one says a word. Yeah, absolutely. So, getting back on track to your story, well, first I got to ask you. So, I've talked to a lot of people that have been involved in in Skills uh Skills Canada, Skills Alberta, stuff like that. Actually, just one of my, I think my, it was my last podcast with Gord King from uh, Careers the Next Generation, who spent some time as an event planner for Skills Alberta, I believe. And he was telling me that, you know, people don't realize these skills competitions get fierce, man. Like they, like they put on a hell of a show from what I understand. So um, I want, I just want my listeners to understand, you know, kind of the the climate of these, these competitions, um, you know, it had to be a, a heck of a feeling for you getting that, that bronze medal because there are hundreds, if not thousands of people at these, at these competitions. Is that right? Oh yeah, that's for sure. And like, I, I can't remember the number of just high school guys I was competing against, but you know, I trained for, I think three months before I went you know, I'd stay late after school and I would take projects home and, you know, practice pipe bending and things like that. And, you know, when I walked in, onto that competition floor to do that, pro- to do my project, you know, you could have cut the tension in there <laughs> with a very dull knife. And, you know, you kind of look at, at the guys you're competing against and you kind of nod and say, good luck. But you're, you kind of say that hoping 
that you beat that guy, right? Of course. And I mean, at our lunch break, you know, we all sat around and chit chatted and but we were it was still kind of you're on edge, you know, you're competing to be the best. And it was it was kind of nerve wracking because there was a lot of college guys in there and there were a few of them who were just giving it their all because they want to win. And then you also you hear some college guys just yelling and laughing and they're like, I only came for the free t-shirt and the lunch. I'm going to go drink beer afterwards. And I'm like, (laughs) how can you guys be laughing? Like, this is serious. (laughs) And I think we had four hours to complete the project and I'm just sweating bullets, like unreal. And I'm just, my hands are shaking and I finished my project and I look it over and I put my tools down and I have to go sit down. I went outside with my parents and I went and sat down in the car and I was just shaking. And all of a sudden I was so incredibly tired. I was like, I don't think I can walk. Oh like, my gosh. It's like my adrenaline was at peak for four hours and I was coming down off this huge adrenaline rush and my body was just like, what do we do now? Man, that is, that's cool. What a, what a great, what a great experience to have, especially, you know, revolving around the trades and and stuff like that. I mean, that just, that sounds like a blast. Um, So I want to get, I want to get back on track a little bit more with your story. Uh, So we left off with you. uh, You were looking for work as an electrician. You had the interview called the next day. They gave you the job. Then what happened? I went into work and on Tuesday, not knowing what to expect. And I was just super thankful that they were, it was a family run company. It was a small company. And, you know, we started off with residential stuff. Uh, We would wire houses for US and Canada. Um, And it was just, you know, simple stuff that I knew how to do. And it was just a really friendly laid back setting, which actually turned out to really hurt me in the long run but you know starting out I couldn't have asked for better people to start out with because it was such a laid-back business you know we didn't really have competition in the area so we worked at our own pace like work started at eight we'd roll out of the shop at like eight thirty nine o'clock and we would be back at the shop by five packing up and going home so that was super relaxed and then when I worked for them for my second year, then we actually started getting into um, installing solar energy systems. And that was, that was like amazing. It was to be able to put something up that is providing a renewable energy source for future generations. You know, I was really proud to be part of that. And our crew actually, I believe, still holds the record for the quickest solar install in our province. Oh, cool. And it was, we, <laughs> man, it's, it kind of makes me emotional going back, starting out. But um, yeah, we, I worked there for two and a half years and we kind of kept on doing a residential thing, doing the solar thing. And then the solar boom ended here in Manitoba. And during that time, because we had focused so much on solar systems, then our companies that we worked for, who we did wiring for, they had moved on to different electricians. And essentially the company had shot itself in the foot that way. And they said, hey, listen, we only have work for you till this and this date. And I was like, fair enough. So I started job hunting and I found another electrical company to work for. And then I moved to that position and it was a completely different experience. I mean, this area where I work in now, it's a super cutthroat, fast paced area where every dollar counts. And the guy I was working for, it was all about speed, speed, speed. And coming from a company that was so laid back and relaxed, you know, there was not really a push that was hard to adjust to. 
And yeah, I bet that's I, a little bit of a culture shock, huh? You're going from one thing, you know, basically the complete opposite end of the spectrum, you know, to the other end of the spectrum, just kind of, I don't want to say overnight, but basically overnight, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the first company I worked for, you know, when we wired a house, we had a plan with basically every wire that we need to run drawn on it. And to go from that to having to figure it out myself, I was lost. I was like, you know, I know I should know these things, but because I was trained in a completely different way, I had to start learning fast. And the second company I worked for, it didn't help that the journeyman I worked for had just a horrible attitude. And that started to rub off on me. And I hated the company I worked for. And I began to hate my boss. And eventually, they hit an incredibly slow period. And, and he laid me off as well. And I couldn't have been more happy to be done working for the guy. And I still had resentment to him, towards him going into the third company, who I, I still currently work for. And it took a fair bit of time to get over that and realize that that was just a result of the people I work for being miserable. But when I switched to the third company, they they were quite understanding with me. They were like, okay, we see that you how you've been trained is not the way we train our guys. So, you know, all praises to them for being incredibly patient for me. But basically, from day one, they said, you're going out on your own. You're going to do jobs. And it was a lot of self-learning, like teaching myself how to do things and learning to ask questions, not just assuming how I'm going to do it this way and then figuring out later, oh, that was completely wrong. Now I have to go back and change it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, too, because learning to ask questions and not only the not only questions in general but the right questions is a skill in and in, in itself you know and and in the industries that we're in these trades industries it is so important to be persistent in learning everything that you can so the right questions to ask and and who to ask them to can be a huge huge catalyst in learning so it, it it sounds like that could have been a learning curve for you too, just knowing what questions to ask and to who. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and also learning when is the right time to ask a question and <laughs> when's the right time to sit there and try and figure it out yourself. Because sometimes I would call, call someone and ask a question and they'd be like, well, you should know that. And like now, if I call a question about something that I know I should know, I'll be like, you know what? I know it sounds stupid. I feel stupid, but you know, I've just forgotten. I haven't done this in a while. And they're like, no, not a big deal. You know, this is how you do it. And it's like, okay, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> that is, that's great. And that's, I think that's a valuable lesson for, for people out there too, because you were able to, to learn how to procure the information in the right way to continue making yourself better at your craft. Absolutely. And you know, right from, from when I was in high school, a big thing that was taught to me was neatness and how neat work shows that you take pride in your work. And that's something, you know, even while wiring a house, which I don't do very often anymore, but like when I drill holes through studs to run my wire, I make sure all the holes are at the same level. When I bring my wires into the box, I always make sure I have tidy loops and that my wires are nice and straight sure it'll be closed off by drywall but it, you know it just it's kind of rewarding to yourself because it's showing yourself that you are taking pride in your work and that you care and someone once told me that your work can look like crap and it can all work but the customer will think that nothing's going to work and they're going to be unhappy with it whereas your work could be immaculate and things couldn't work but they still won't be upset that upset about it because it looks nice yeah no it's definitely there's a lot to be said and taking pride in your craft you know i i tell uh my employees my technicians here you know you're only as good as your last job and you know it, it it's just so true you know the other thing that we say is leave it better than you found it 
because that's essentially saying the same thing that that you're saying right now is you know it there it, it's presentation right it we're we're talking about the perceptions of the skilled trades and it's up to each and every one of us to drive those perceptions any way that we possibly can in the right direction and a very easy way to do that is to have pride in your work and and work clean for lack of a better term you know make sure it looks presentable make sure that you know if somebody were to look at that work it's clear to them that you care about what you're doing absolutely and you know I know even my parents when we'll get like a plumber down or something and they'll leave their dirty boots on and they march into the house and afterwards my mom goes oh that I, just makes me so mad like couldn't they put on a pair of clean shoes or something and that's even something as small as that like I make sure either I have a clean pair of shoes in the van or you know I'll just take my boots off to run into someone's house to check a plug or something it's <coughs> sorry it's it's small things like that or you know sweeping up after you've cut a hole in the wall and just such attention to detail speaks such great volumes to the customer yeah it it definitely does and it teaches you know i often talk about you know uh transferable skills and and different characteristics that the trades teach right and that's that's one of those things if you're if you're a clean person and you're just naturally organized then sure you're going to do well in the trades but if you allow yourself to develop these things while you're in the trades you're going to be better for it in other aspects of your life too you know like the cleanliness is is one small example right but i like to relate things back like communication you know how many times that i've had to explain to a customer what i'm doing and i forget that they don't they don't have a clue about any of the terminology that i'm using or anything like that so so we learn to break through these barriers of communication you know in these industries too and that translates directly into our personal life right like i i don't fight with my wife nearly as often as i used to because now i can i've learned to communicate because of the skilled trades you know i can i can talk to my kids better because of the skilled trades and people don't often make those associations you know with with the industry but i like to because i think that as many benefits that we can highlight as possible even if that's personal development you know the better off the trades are going to be seen absolutely and you know just i just thought of that when you mentioned communication like sometimes i'll go to a job where you know, I'll get the work order. Oh, a GFCI plug isn't working. And I'll go there and the, the customer will tell me, I put it back in exactly how I took it out. And, you know, I'll take it apart, switch the wires around because he had not connected it the way it was <laughs> and put it back in. But you have to learn to not make the customer feel stupid for making that mistake. And, you know, just assuring them, hey, you know what? It happens to a lot of people that, you know, they don't pay attention to that because it's easy to mix up. And I'll say, hey, you know what? I've mixed it up before, too. It's not a big deal. And I had a call just the other day where they said, the customer said, our plugs in our sunroom aren't working. And first thing I did was check for power. Well, there was no power there. So I went to their, their fuse panel and it was just a blown fuse. And it's been the second time I've been there and each time they feel stupid. It's like, you know what? I don't, I don't blame you because not everyone has the aptitude to think of these things and look for them. Right. Yep. Or, and whereas, go ahead. I was just going to say, and that's, that's another testament to, you know, the skilled trades in general of the knowledge that people have, you know, you mentioned earlier uh, a perception of, well, tradespeople, you know, sometimes people look at tradespeople as dumb or they couldn't cut it or whatnot. And and you just hit on another point, you know, of the intelligence that tradespeople have that that a lot of other people don't. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I know it's with, especially like communication is such a huge thing, whether it's talking to your, your boss or talking to customers 
or talking to your helpers even. I mean, usually I don't have a helper with me. I'm kind of a a lone wolf. I go out and do my jobs by myself, but that's a big area that I struggle with is, you know, directing other people when they're working with me to find things for them to do. But, you know, it's it's always you're always learning on your feet on the fly. And that's the beauty of it. You're you don't have to sit down, take a course on how to work with other people, you know, you just find ways to make it work. It's, it's part of the problem solving. And that's a huge thing in the trades is learning how to problem solve, you know, make do with what you have. Yeah, no, absolutely. Making do with what you have and, and problem solving another transferable skill, another thing that can benefit you in your everyday life. Um, absolutely. And that's, it, it's just, you know, it's so nice hearing, you know, and talking to you about that because it, it's just, it, it makes it so much more evident, you know, when we have this conversation of how many things, you know, the, the skilled trades help to develop in people, um, which I think is important because I can honestly say, I don't think that every career out there can do the same. You know, a lot of it is just the same stuff every single day over and over again, Whereas in the trades, every day is something new. You're always learning something. You're always doing something. You're always trying something. As my dad says, it's not just a job. It's an adventure, right? And and that holds true. You know, I've been in, in my trade now for 12, 13 years. And I don't think a day has gone by where there wasn't at least something about the trade itself or about tools or about the people around me or the people that, that I'm serving you know, that I didn't learn something small. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you bring up tools because when I go tool shopping, I'm like a kid in a candy shop. Like the excitement I have to buy a new tool and learn how to use it, it's just, it's insane. And not that long ago, I, I got the Milwaukee Packout, something I've been, have I had my eye on for so long and I finally purchased it. And my parents are like, Oh man, like you love that thing. It's like, yeah, I do. You know, it's going to help me be more efficient, you know, be more organized, keep better track of my tools. And the perception of when you wheel that onto a job site, people know you're here to do business and they know that you're efficient and customers will comment on it. I'm like, yeah, I make one trip to my van and I have everything that I need. Yeah. And it's it efficiency is such a huge thing because time is money. That absolutely right. Time is money. And so clearly your your passion for the trades and your passion for what you do runs deep. I, I want to touch on it. I, I especially want to touch on it before you know this episode is over. But I imagine that passion is what led you to start a podcast of your own. Is that right? Absolutely. You know. And I know my podcast partner, he feels very much the same way I do. And, you know, we want to see good work. And often, like him and I talk throughout the day all the time. And, you know, we'll send pictures of shoddy workmanship that we find in the field and send it to each other and laugh at it. And we've also discussed, you know, when we go into a restaurant, when we sit down, the first thing we do is not look at the menus. We look at the ceiling. And we look at the pipe runs, the ducting, <laughs> and we judge other people's work because we take pride in our work and we have so much pride for the work we do. And we love our jobs and our careers that, you know, we figured, hey, let's make a podcast about it so other people can fall in love with the same things we've fallen in love with. Yeah, absolutely. And and so is that the kind of stuff that you guys talk about? It just like uh, uh, what makes good quality work and, and how to achieve that? Is that, is that like the, the premise of the show or does it go beyond that? Um, I would say it, it goes beyond that. You know, we we love to welcome other people on our show as well and, you know, get their percep- perception on, on the trades and their stories, kind of like what you have done with getting other people's stories on how they came to the trades. And, you know, a lot of our show is highlighting things we've done throughout the week, you know, cool things that we've 
seen throughout the week, you know, crappy things that we had to work on or, you know, just kind of detailing the things us trades guys go through day to day. So people kind of, it's our show is kind of raw. We want people to have an unbiased opinion, I guess. Like we don't come in with rose colored glasses on. We don't want other people coming into the trades fresh with rose colored glasses on either, because to be honest, each day is different. One day you can be crawling around in a muddy trench, pulling wires. The next day you could be installing light fixtures in a new house, clean and dry. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I'm, I'm really, really excited to get this episode out there because I think there's, there's more people. And I think that we probably have a, uh, a lot of similar listeners and I, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to kind of, uh, guide some of my listeners to your show because I think it would be incredibly intriguing to them. You know, I know a, a, a lot of them have reached out to me, so I kind of know who they are and and how they work. And and uh, it just sounds like something that they would be interested in. So I'm really, really excited about that. I've got a couple specific questions here that I want to ask you. Um, I was going to do kind of a rapid fire format, but I, I, I don't really like the rapid fire thing. You know, I was going to try it, but then I was like, no, I really want to hear your actual answers on this. So I want to know from you what the most rewarding part of your career is. And when I say career, I'm talking as a whole in the trades, you know, encompassing your journey, the the people you've worked for, the podcast that you've started. What's the most rewarding part of all of it? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um... I would have to say that the most rewarding thing to me is the satisfaction of completed quality work and seeing the look on the customer's face when they see that work completed. Like something as simple as turning lights on when you finish a house or, you know, the progress when they come in and look at the progress and just to see the joy on their face when they see that work coming along to me that is huge or even like i do a lot of service calls when i when they call me and they need something fixed and i repair it just to see how thankful they are that it's running that has to be the most rewarding thing for me in my career yeah i i gotta share that with you cal because that's uh there there's few things that compare to to that you know being able to to impress somebody, being able to serve somebody in a capacity that they they just overwhelmingly want to say thank you a thousand times, thank you. You know, it's uh, it, it makes you feel good at the end of the day. I mean, there's really no other way to put it, right? It just makes you feel good. Absolutely. It's like an instant dopamine hit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. So how about the biggest lesson? What's the biggest lesson that you've learned? Uh, One of the biggest lessons that I've learned is don't be afraid to ask questions. And what you may think is a stupid question could very well not be a stupid question. Yeah, no, that's a good one, you know, um, because the second that you're afraid to ask, right, is the second that that you don't get the information that, that you need to know. And, you know, then you're inhibiting your own growth at that point. So I think that's fantastic advice. And that, that's a, a heck of a lesson. Um, and one that the trades will teach you pretty, pretty damn quick. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> because if you, if you don't ask and you just decide to do it yourself and you don't really know what you're doing, uh, well, we all know what happens then. Yeah, so, absolutely. <laughs> all right. So last question I have for you. I'd like to ask all my guests this, and then I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to... Uh, uh, share anything with us that that you wanted to before we before we end the podcast. But we talk about success. I talk about success a lot in in my book, in my podcast. With you know, everybody has their own definition of it, right? And oftentimes, kids these days are pushed toward a definition of success that isn't their own. It's defined by their educators or their counselors or their parents. You know, sometimes. And, you know, sometimes these kids just don't have an opportunity to, to really understand 
and work toward whatever they deem as success. So I want to know from you, Kel, how do you define success? I would have to define success as simply being everything that I can be, putting 100% of my heart and soul into what I do, you know, just giving each project my all. That would have to be success for me. It's, it's not about the money. It's not about, you know, being famous on social media. It's just I want to do the best I can at everything I do. And if I am able to do the best that I can do, to me, that's success. That's such a great answer to, to defining success. I, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%, you know, and, and there's, there's satisfaction in that, that that compares to nothing else. You know, just just being everything that you can be and making sure that that, you know, everything that you do is done with 110 percent effort. Nobody, nobody can ever take that away from you. And that is a great, great definition. So before we sign off today, is there anything else that you wanted to say to our audience? Um, well, you know, for any young people that are listening, I have to, you know, just encourage, encourage you, you know, don't write off the trades as a possibility. You know, it's an amazing line of work to get into. You know, we don't all have to be electricians or plumbers. You know, there's so many trades out there and it's such a great opportunity. Don't let other people tell you otherwise. It's a fulfilling career and you're almost guaranteed to have work even when the rest of the world is shut down as we've seen us trades people have still had work yeah i i agree obviously 100 percent with that and i can't say it enough times and i'm so happy that you said it too because then i'm not alone so cal uh, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Why don't you tell people uh, how they can find you, how they can find your podcast? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, our our show is called Skilled Trades Podcast. We we have a bit of an erratic upload schedule. We were doing every other week. Now we've been doing weekly as we've had more guests. You know, it's just two guys chatting about everyday life in the trades. and. You know, you can find us on almost every podcast platform. We're also on Spotify. Uh, we encourage you to reach out to us um, through our Instagram, which is Skilled Trades Podcast, or even shooting us an email, Skilled Trades Podcast at gmail.com. Um, you know, we look forward to hearing from young people and other people in the trades and feeling their support and answering their questions it's just we're there for the blue collar family and we're so proud of the blue collar family on our show and we just want to show that support awesome well cal thank you so much for spending your valuable time with me today and sharing your story with our listeners i know that people are gonna love this episode so just thank you so much for coming on the show no, thank you for having me. It was it was honestly a great pleasure. Awesome. Well, Cal, be well. And until next time, my friend. Right on. Thank you.